So my name is Mel Bourgo, and I'm on the board of uh, directors for the Alliance Française. And um, just as a person who's always been interested in all things French, somehow in my readings, I came across an article about something called the Merci Train. And I got rather curious, and this curiosity led me to the people who are going to be speaking to you today. For those of you that aren't quite sure, the Merci Train in French is the uh, Train de la Reconnaissance. It resulted from the fact that dir uh, directly after World War II, the United States government and its people uh, sent shipload after shiploads of supplies, food, clothing, etc., to the peoples of Europe, uh, including France. And the French people were so grateful for this help. I believe uh, it probably saved many lives. Um, they were so grateful that in return, um, the people of France got together and sent over um, on ship uh, box cars, train box cars full of artifacts and souvenirs and mementos and as gratitude. So they sent over 49 train box cars and um, each uh, box car was to go to a state of the United States and we're we're going to hear from um, Mr. Lorenz when he's available later on in this talk about the boxcars themselves. But the story really is a people story. It's a human interest story. And in particular, it's a family story for one of our own Alliance members. And that would be Brigitte. Uh, Heltzer, who's here with us. And just to give you a little background about Brigitte herself, she was born in France in the Alsace village of Riboville. She immigrated with her family to the U.S. in 1948, uh, grew up in Illinois. Uh, her father was a chemist. She herself became a nurse and eventually a nursing administrator and worked in several places in the country. She and her family moved to Vermont in 1989 and she's happily retired from her nursing administration career. But she has a story to tell us about her family and how she herself became connected with the history of the Merci train. So Brigitte, I'll let you um, talk to us. Okay, you already gave my story, so. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Okay, well, we'll go back a little bit here. Mm -hmm. In early 1947, France and Europe were still reeling from the war. Food was scarce, the rebuilding had barely begun. The financial situation was dire. In the US, the famous newscaster and columnist, Drew Pearson, seeing all this, made a suggestion and then reached out to Americans to send food and supplies to France and Italy. There was an outpouring of compassion from this country and each state tried to outdo the other. Even Hawaii, that was still not a state, donated two railroad cars filled with sugar. Around November 1st, 1947, a special train pulling 11 freight cars of food, clothing and medical supplies left Los Angeles heading for New York. It picked up cars on the way. Texas alone donated 29 railroad cars full of supplies. Rich and poor donated. In the end, more than 700 railroad cars were filled with donations. It was estimated that it had a 1947 value of $40 million. This, this was delivered to France on December 14, 1947. I'd like to back up a bit now and tell you the story how I eventually fit, fit into this picture. As Mel said, I was born on November 30th, 
1941 in a small village in occupied Alsace at the foot of the Vosges Mountains. Slide one, please. Oops. Beautiful. Okay. Um, wow, pretty village. This is uh, Ribovile. Uh, my birth certificate showed I was born on Adolf Hitler's Strauss. France had declared war on Germany on September 1, 1939, when Poland was invaded. Within days, Germany declared war on France and quickly occupied Alsace and Noël by early 1940. They had wanted to do that since they had lost these provinces at the end of World War I. The German military officials had a very strict policy on Germanization and Nazification that included changing Alsatians into German citizens. They took over every part of the bureaucracy, changed all the names of the streets, and everyone had to speak German, and only German could be taught in the schools. My older sister, who knew Alsatian and French, was forced to learn German very quickly. Since I was born on a weekend, my parents had time until Monday morning to declare my birth and to find a name for me that was spelled the same in French and German, therefore Brigitte or Brigitte. Yeah. The occupation was very difficult for my parents. My mother didn't speak German since she was from the interior of France in the North. My father had served in the French army in 1939 but had been released because he was needed in the war effort back home. As a chemist working for Peugeot, he was assigned to making charcoal for fuel to be used in the military trucks since there was little gasoline available. In January, 1944, he was conscripted into the German army when they were desperate for soldiers. They had already taken many of the younger Alsatian men earlier in the war. They were called the Malgainu. He eventually was sent to the Russian front driving an ammunition truck. Meanwhile, six months later, on June 6, 1944, D-Day unfolded. There were whispers in the village about it. Les Américains arrivent, les Américains arrivent. The, the Americans are coming, but there were no details and it became a long wait. It wasn't until six months later that we started to hear the gunfire in the mountains above the village. Excitement as well as fear was palpable. The Germans quickly packed up and left. I was three at the time and we were living with friends to await the return of my father. The morning of December 3rd, I woke up hearing a lot of commotion. As I looked out the window, the square below was filled with American tanks. Mm. It is such a vivid memory for me. I could feel the excitement around me, but no one knew what to do, greet the soldiers or not. There was some fear of them. Finally, my mother decided to dress my sister and I in our Alsatian costumes, and we went down to meet the soldiers. I quickly learned a few words. Speak English? No, no. Speak French? Oui, oui. Chocolate? Chewing gum? Don't know about the gum, didn't know about the gum then, but chocolate was a big hit. Soon the French soldiers arrived. Slide two, please. Uh, and the picture started again. So this is a group of family and friends and some of the American, some of the French soldiers that had followed the Americans into our village. Is this you in the picture, Brigitte? Yes, right here. See the, the little one the here. Smallest, the smaller of the two. Yes. Okay. Yeah, my name is right there. All right. Thanks. Meanwhile, wow. my father still had not returned. We learned at some point that the Americans were bombing the Germans at the Russian front. My father took the opportunity when he could to flee his munitions truck and escape. He somehow had met some Dutch prisoners in a labor camp who gave him some civilian clothes and helped him burn his German uniform and papers. Wow. All he had left to identify himself was a French cocade. And I don't know if you can 
see this, but it's a little French ribbon. It's a bleu blanc rouge ribbon, and he would carry this inside his clothes to show that he was French. It took him three months walking to find the Americans. He was trying to evade the Russians, so he often had to backtrack. Slept in barns and finally found the Americans, who eventually took him to Strasbourg in June 1945, six months after our village had been liberated. The armistice had been signed on May 8th, 1945. The years immediately after the war were difficult. In 1947, after the effects of the war were still weighed heavily on my father, both economically and psychologically. Yeah. Um, and also the Marshall Plan would not go into effect until March, 1948. So my parents finally decided to immigrate to the US at the urging of an uncle in New York, Long Island. The paperwork was quickly accepted by the US Embassy. In early 1948, the date was set to embark for New York. It would be on my seventh birthday, November 30th, 1948. Meanwhile, during this time in France, a railroad worker and an army veteran, Andre Picard, had come up with the idea of sending a mercy boxcar full of gifts for the American people who had been so generous with the friendship train. The idea grew, a committee was formed, and finally, they decided that each state should get a boxcar in Hawaii and DC would share one. The gifts kept pouring in at the Gare d'Orsay in Paris. The gifts would number at some point more than 52,000. And can we do the slide three and can we do two at a time? Or So I just wanted to show you what, this is one of the Vermont gifts. And we had a lot of these, uh, children would write letters thanking the Americans. And I don't know if you can read it or if you want me to read it. Um, it's in French, but it's very, um, it was very emotional for me when I read it. There's a bunch of them that I had read at the museum because it was, you know, the, the children in this letter are the same age I was at the time when I came to America. So it was really very poignant for me. And uh, the other slide, so this is sort of a, um, the, the letters and then there were massive other kinds of gifts, but this is another really one that stood out for me. It's a medical um, anatomy book that was given to this widow of a, uh, a physician. And it's a, it's, it was written in 1585. Um, and it's just massive, just massive book, very thick. And she sent it to America just as a gift, um, gratitude in, yeah. in memory of her uh, of her husband. So I'm getting I'm getting the feeling that people just whatever they had that was precious to them in France. Yeah, yeah. can you can you wait till the end and uh, sure. you're gonna, those are some yeah. of the things, the questions that people may have. Um, so I also like to read uh, Drew Pearson's description of, mm -hmm. of the gifts that, that came. Um, the French committee has not given us a specific request that there be no auctioning of gifts. The French donors now believe that auctions would place smaller and less prosperous communities in the United States at a disadvantage against wealthy communities. Um, so then he goes on to say that, um, although the French committee has not yet been able to send us a detailed inventory of each boxcar, we now have considerable more information. Incidentally, in this connection, my brother, Leon Pearson, who has been in Paris, writes of touching scenes at the Gare d'Orsay, where more than a thousand gifts from all sorts of people were turned down at the last minute because there was no more room in the boxcars. It's touching to know that this gesture from France, originally organized by the French railway workers who were war, war veterans, 
has now spread until it has touched almost every stratum of French life. Just as the friendship train was made possible by Americans of every walk of life, so the gifts of the French, thank you train, it is estimated have come from 6 million French people. They have come from such groups as orphan homes, schools, chambers of commerce, veterans groups, professional institutes, rotary clubs, the Grand Chancellor of the Legion of Honor, organizations from provinces and from cities. The gifts include magnificent works of art, historic souvenirs, objects of folklore, 49 Seville vases presented personally by the president of France. And going further, he goes, talks about tapestry, recalling the past and present of history of France, the master glassworkers of Chartres, Agano and Angers have created special glasswork for their American friends. Needleworkers of Paris surpassing themselves have devised 49 small mannequins dressed in clothes, hats, hose, depicting the fashion of Paris across the ages. It is considered the most beautiful collection ever gathered together. So this is some of the ideas of what was in the boxcars. Um, the committee decided also that the box, the that they would use antique box cars that many American of World War I would remember, the 40 and 8. Each car would be identical and have coat of arms of the provinces in France. Nice slide. Next slide, please. So this is actually the Vermont box car, but it gives you an idea of what. It looked like, of course, it's black and white. Um, but each car on the front, it had the French, train de la reconnaissance française. And on the other side, it had in English, the gratitude train. On the left here is a, is a tag that was put on all the gifts that were put in the boxcars. And also the, the drawing here is a symbol that they put on all the boxcars. I don't know if I can, I can't point to that, can I? <laughs> but on the lower left-hand corner, there's a symbol of the a train and also uh, uh, flowers, which, which uh, depict um, the Flanders fields, the poppies of Flanders fields. So they, they're sort of giving another nod to the World War I vets. Um, also, all the provinces had a coat of arms, so each side would have it's a combination of all the provinces in France. And um, so the 49 boxcars are finally filled to capacity and put on a ship by the end of 1948. The Magellan was to arrive in New York on February 3rd, 1949. Around this time, my family was preparing to leave France. After many tearful goodbyes, we left Paris. When we left Paris in the boat train to embark on the De Glace and Le Havre, everyone on the platform spontaneously started singing Old Lang Syne, which in French is, Ce n'est qu'un au revoir, mes frères. Many people on the train were immigrants like we were. I'll never forget that scene and the emotion I felt even though I didn't quite understand for a long time why they were all singing and why they were, everyone was crying. After a turbulent crossing of nine days, slide six. Um, this is a picture of us sort of on the first days of the, on the ship as my parents and friends that we met on the ship, and my sister. Um, so it's sort of the Titanic photo of the time. Um, we arrived, it was very turbulent after that. We had storms the whole time. And we arrived on nine days later on December 9. And of course, seeing New York was just an amazing sight for us. We spent a long day on the dock waiting for customs to clear the nine trunks we had brought with us. My father would periodically put me on his shoulders so that his uncle who was waiting behind the barriers could identify us in the crowd. 
We finally connected and somehow all nine trunks were sent on, our, on their way. On the way to Long Island, we drove through Manhattan. It was pure magic for me. There were so many lights. In addition, all the lighted Christmas decorations were up. France was still dark in those days. So I never, have, never had seen anything like this, but I was baffled since Christmas was still several weeks away. Why the Christmas decorations were already up. We settled a bit in my uncle's house, my parents trying to decide what their next step would be and how to deal with being far from home and family during the holidays. My sister and I had started school at that point, began to learn English. Sometime in January, friends of my uncle and aunt who were part of the Alsatian Society of New York, wonder if they could borrow me for a big event happening on February 3rd. 1949, the arrival of the gratitude train, wearing my Alsatian costume. When the time came, I stayed overnight in Manhattan with friends. My uncle did not want to drive in Manhattan for this event, so my parents <clears throat> were not able to see the parade. When the ship, the Magellan, had reached New York, it was greeted by a large flotilla of small boats. The freighter itself was emblazoned with a huge description, inscription, Merci, America. While the Air Force planes roared by in an aerial salute and fireboats sent columns of spray. So you can imagine the, the, and all these small boats were just following this, this uh, freighter. I don't remember much about the parade. I did walk behind the boxcar for a bit. It's, Next slide. And I think I'm behind that boxcar. That's the New York boxcar there. Um, but I do remember having my picture taken in the boxcar. Next slide. And I was, I remember the picture being taken. I was very enamored of the French major that was speaking French to me. I was so happy to speak French. <laughs> when my mother saw the pictures in the paper the next day, she cut out the pictures, but since she didn't speak English, didn't bother to cut the articles. And it was years later when I rediscovered the picture and I got curious about that time and tried at one time to find the articles in New York at the New York Library. Apparently the papers were defunct and did not keep their archives. I did find a lot of articles in New York Times and was shocked about how big a deal it was the day the boxcars arrived in New York City. Eleanor Roosevelt was there among the many dignitaries from France and the US. It was a huge parade. There were French students, there were American students, there were French Boy Scouts, American Boy Scouts, bands, everything you can imagine, a huge parade in New York. Later, during times on the internet, on the internet, I came across someone who had compiled some of the story from different states and the status of their boxcars. This was Earl Bennett. His name is Earl Bennett, and he started this site on the internet. And when I wrote to him, he was thrilled about my story and included my pictures. It's just this on his website. Several people have since then contacted me about being part of a documentary or writing a book. But no, so far, none of that has come to fruition. I did, however, go to New York, North Carolina in 2019 at the invitation of the Raleigh Transportation Museum for the 70th anniversary of the Mercy Train. They had a massive celebration for 49 days, calling it the 49 Days of Gratitude, and had totally restored their boxcar to its original form. It was an amazing event. They also exhibited many of the gifts that were in their box car. Here in Vermont, I was excited to find the Vermont box car in the military museum at Camp Johnson to be part of the celebration of the, and to be part of their celebration of the 70th anniversary. Do you wanna put the, the last slide on? So this is how the box car at this time looks, and, and Richard, I'm sure will tell you more about it. 
Just wanted to, I also got involved here at the Historical Society Museum in Barrie. The registrar there helped locate many of the files regarding the Vermont involvement. And then we also found 20 or so boxes of gifts remaining that had never been cataloged. <clears throat> there had been initial inventory, but it was hard to correlate with what we saw. A wonderful volunteer, Nancy Remsen, started to systematically put the items in their picture in the museum database. And all the items were carefully rewrapped and put in acid-free bags, boxes. And I would help her with any translations she needed. This database is not complete and can be accessed. And I have the info if anybody wants it. There's also an inventory at the Fleming Museum. Um, and I was able to see a small portion of that, but they have no plans to display any of these items. It's really, um, one of the other things that's interesting about this is the logistics of getting the boxcars to different states. And I just want to go over a bit of the New England train schedule that was done by the, the Friendship Committee. Um, it's been, it was a difficult, I'm just reading this for you, that it has been a difficult task due in part to the fact that French World War 40 and eight boxcars are to be carried on American flat cars, making the total height too high in some cases to clear tunnels and overhead electric wires. Thus a New England train is not able to travel on the main line of the New Haven Railroad because of overhead electrification and must take the alternate route across the center of the state. The New York, New England route has been planned with a view to carrying out the wishes of the French people, namely that as many of the American people as possible shall see this gesture of friendship from France. Railroads have generously consented to stop at as many stations as possible. And by displaying the cars for different states in the states through which they pass, the number of spectators can be doubled or tripled. Thus, the people of Western Massachusetts are fortunate in being able to see the Vermont car as it passes north through Springfield, Holyoke, New Hampshire, New Ham Northampton, and Greenfield. Likewise, the people of Eastern Massachusetts will be able to see the main car as it goes north via Lowell and Lawrence. In addition, their own Massachusetts car will stop in Boston. They were hoping that publicity would be given to these car stops and the brief ceremonies would be arranged at each, as each car passed through. Uh, some of the governors followed the box cars. They stayed on the train as they went through the state. Um, and when the cars arrived at <clears throat> state capitals, the, dis the disposition of the gifts was totally up to the local committee. And so that was a very complicated task. And nobody really knew what to do about the gifts. Um, here in Vermont, it was um, one person deciding, it was distributed by an Earl Newton, who was director of the Vermont Historical Society at the time. So he was trying to be equitable to everyone. And many of the legislators would take back gifts to their towns, <clears throat> many items, when appropriate, were given to high school, French school, uh, French classes. They were also given to schools in general for gifts if someone did well in a test. But it was not clear exactly where all the gifts went. Um, some of them were in those 20 boxes, but there were a lot of gifts that should have been included, but were not. Um, so it's kind of still a big mystery as to where all these, uh, especially the more um, valuable gifts went. There are some really good paintings in the inventory at the Berry Museum. A um, lot of small, small cars from car manufacturers as toys. Um, baby layettes. There were women who, or seamstress, I would say, 
I get, I will make a lingerie for any veteran that might, uh, gets married and, and I will send this to the, his wife. I mean, there were just amazing amount of different gifts that were, that were given. So that's, that's sort of the gist of the Mercy, Mercy car. It has a lot of little tentacles all over the stories, but give it over to Richard. Okay, let me just uh, thank you, Brigitte, for your uh, personal story, your family story, as well as the history of this train. Um, can I just ask you, at what point in your life did you decide, you know, realize that this was quite an event um, that you were part of? And when did you start collecting and getting information? Well, do you want to wait till after the question, when the questions come up, they, that be part of the questions or do we want to stop now? Eric, you're muted, Eric. I think you're muted, Eric. Oh, that's okay. Um, Yes, well, that will be my question when when we have questions. Um, let's go ahead and go on to Richard. Um, Richard Lorenz is the current president of the Vermont Military Museum, uh, which is in um, it's it's the National Guard uh, Military Museum, which is in Colchester, right here. Uh, he's been uh, with the museum for nine years. He is also a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, having had a lengthy career and uh, served our country all over the world in different places. He comes to Vermont through his college education, which was at St. Michael's. Uh, he graduated there in 1964 and um, retired to Milton, I understand. and has now become president of the Military Museum in Colchester. And Mr. Lawrence, if you could give us some of your information as, uh, as you have it, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I think Brigitte uh, stole most of my thunder as she did when we had our 70th anniversary <laughs> story here. Uh, hopefully I don't repeat too much about it. Um, can I uh, take the slide off? Because I want to do is I want to use my uh, iPad to show some, there we go, some of the things. Behind me is the uh, rail car uh, that you saw a picture of, but this is the actual rail car as it, as it sits in our museum. Um, and as we talked about earlier, uh, the rail car, the significance of the rail car is that this is how the soldiers were taken to the front lines in both World War I and World War II. Um, and during those wars, they were packed inside of these things. And we're going to turn, hopefully this works for us. Kind of gives you an idea of what these cars are about. Uh, the soldiers were packed inside of these, these rail cars, just as so you see them. There was no, uh, no latrine facilities. There was no dining facilities. Uh, they would pack 40 of them inside or eight horses, the term 48 comes from that, where it is, uh, it, it, it is how many people can, or horses you can put inside of it. We have a, uh, a, a um, I should say, a, a volunteer who used to be here up until about two years ago. Maybe you, perhaps you know him, Bob Pichet. Uh, he's from Winooski. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually rode in one of these rail cars during the Battle of the Bulge, and he can tell you firsthand that it was a very uncomfortable ride and it wasn't a lot of fun. Um, the rail car that we have here has been uh, modified uh, about two or three years ago. We had an Eagle Scout come in and he kind of redid the signage or the, uh, the plaques on the outside of the car. The original plaques uh, looked like this. If I can do this. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to do this backwards. Is that coming through at all? Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
is backwards. Anyway, um, I won't deal with that. As Brigitte mentioned, uh, the rail car had both a French and a, a English side to it. This happens to be the French side. The plaques represent the 40 provinces of France, uh, which is why they're on there. And it did not have the horse's head. We added that a little bit later. And uh, outside of that is pretty much what you see. This rail car that we have in Vermont is very unique uh, in that it has a brakeman station in the back. Most of them don't have that. This one happens to have it uh, as you see it. These rail cars are, very, are a lot more famous than you realize. Uh, there's a couple of national motorcycle groups that actually put these, uh, these rail cars in their scavenger hunt. And we'll have motorcycles pull up in the parking lot here and people will run into the museum and climb these stairs and take pictures and off they'll go to their next scavenger hunt. Uh, we've had about uh, three or four of them over the last five years. Mm -hmm. These rail cars have a lot of international interest. We've had people from Denmark come in and look through the rail cars looking for serial numbers. And uh, they are very, very dedicated to them. This is one of the few rail cars you're going to see the doors are open. Most of the rail cars are sitting outside in parks uh, and being weather beaten. Uh, if, you, if you ever look up and... and um, on uh, the internet and look up Merci train, you'll see where all the rail cars are. As of now, we think there are seven or eight that have been actually destroyed. This is one of the few that's been inside. This building was built specifically to house this rail car, really? as you see it. And it's been here for 30 years, so it's very, very well preserved. It looks uh, pretty much as it did. If you go inside of it, you get a sense about what this thing actually looked like. And outside of the, uh, you would put 40 people inside of here with their rail, with their guns and their packs. And that's about it. I'm gonna say it's about 25 feet long and about uh, 12 feet high. And this is where they had to sleep while they're, as they traveled to the front lines. These rail cars were built, originally started being built in 1870. This one happens to be built in uh, 1890, as near as we can tell. Uh, they were used both by the, Ger by the Germans during World War II to move people around. And they're also used by Americans who, uh, and the French to uh, move people to the front lines. That kind of gives you an idea what these things look like. Mm -hmm. I don't kill myself. We talked a little bit earlier about the, uh, the gifts that were inside. There is a, uh, the North Dakota um, National State Museum has a, a very good record of what the gifts were inside of these rail cars. As Brigitte mentioned, uh, there were, all 49 of the cars uh, were stuffed with, with uh, various kinds of artifacts. And this is uh, some pictures of what they may have looked like. And again, this isn't working very well. But if you go on and you look at the North Dakota site, you'll, you'll see that uh, they have a good record of what they all look like. And here again is Brigitte when she was a young girl as a, as a rail car came into uh, New York City. Um, I don't know what else I can say about the rail car except that's what it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how it's long have, has it been uh, there? Richard? It has been here, it has been here for 30 years. The rail car came into Montpelier originally. And uh, from there, after the, uh, the goods have been distributed, it wound up in White River Junction for a while, then ultimately up in St. Albans. Uh, forgot how many years it spent in St. Albans, but once it was up there, the, there's an organization called the 40 and 8, which refers to the number of soldiers or horses you can put in that actually was taking care of the car up there and about 30, 32 years ago, donated it to the National Guard and they wound up inside in our building here. Again, this building was built specifically to house the rail car as you see it. Okay. We're very happy to have it. <coughs> Excuse me. I apologize for the presentation that the Zoom didn't work very well, but uh, okay. you get an idea of what, the, what it looks like.
thank you so much for uh, showing us an actual boxcar here, right here yeah. in Vermont. Um, I'm sure many people like myself just never realized that this important historical uh, thing was, was right here in our backyard. Uh, what are the hours of visitation for your museum in case some of our members want to come and actually um, view the boxcar? Well, we are open Monday through Friday, 10 to three. But just as important as the rail car, I want to brag a little bit about some of our holdings out here. Sure. We have, we have uh, a mural that was painted uh, in 1890 uh, by a Vermont by the name Charles Andres that is, uh, depicts the Battle of Cedar Creek during the Civil War. And I have to do this upside down and backwards, I'm sorry, but it's, uh, it's a very unique painting. It is uh, one of the largest single pieces of linen or uh, artist material ever produced in Paris. And uh, it's been in our museum for about 30 years as well. Very, very nicely done. There are lots of artifacts in here depicting not just the National Guard, but also the, any Vermonter that ever served in any of the branches of the service are recognized here as well. And we'd love to have anybody who wants to come visit us. It's free. Again, it's open 10 to 3 on uh, Monday through Friday. It's a wonderful museum. Well, thank you so much. Um, Eric, if you have um, some questions on chat, I can't see the chat function from my screen, but if people have any questions, um, now is the time for you to ask. Eric, you're muted. Can't hear you. Yeah, he's... Eric, you're muted. <laughs> well, it's such a fascinating topic. I'm I'm sure there are people that this has sparked their interest and curiosity. Um, I do want to mention that we know there are artifacts. I don't believe there are any artifacts uh, from the Vermont train left in the actual boxcar. However, they are stored, as you said, Brigitte, some at the Fleming Museum, and then there are some okay. at the Vermont Historical Society. And for people that would like to look up uh, what these artifacts might be, if you go online to vermonthistory.org, you get to that website, you go to the caption discover, which is on a green bar at the top of the um, museum's homepage. That's the Vermont Historical Society. That's their website. Um, you check on museum catalog and then you enter in Merci Train in the search box and you should be able to see pictures of some of the actual artifacts. So again, that's vermonthistory.org go to discover, go to museum catalog, and then put in Merci Train. Yep. So Eric, I, I was saying I, that, I, yeah. yeah, okay, I am back. I am, I am no longer muted. Um, I'm afraid my computer screen froze and I'm now on the computer that Kim was using. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's so I can manage it. And there, there's one, there's one question in the chat. Okay. And it said, you said there are about twenty boxes left undistributed. Are are there any plans to distribute those? No, not not at this time. It's hard to know how to distribute. There were some things that were uh, like there were several French books that were given to Middlebury College. There was uh, some papers from Marquis de Lafayette which I think were also given to Middlebury College. Um, of course, Fleming Museum has some, but no, I think there's no, I mean, 
I'm not sure the interest is there anymore, but I think there's not a very equitable way to distribute this on how would you do it. Um, so that the museum will keep them maybe once in a while, they'll just, they'll show them, but it's, um, it's sad because I think the, fr the French, um, especially the kids, and I think a lot of American kids did write back, like some of them, the letters that were given to the schools, the students in the class did write back to the French students. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know how many, you know, actually did. There's no indication of what happened. Um, so I don't know, it's kind of a mystery at this point. Brigitte, uh, qu a question. Where are, the, where are these boxes being re uh, retained? In the museum itself, the, the, historic, the Vermont, Historical Society Museum okay. in Barrie. Yeah, okay. I didn't realize they had that many. Yeah, they didn't either. Um, I mean, there were there were dolls from each. It was like you know, one picture. Of, but like every yeah, every yeah. Um, province had their doll in their in their costume in there. So each box car get, had that as well. This is an Alsatian costume. Yeah. That was like what you were wearing in that picture of you. Right. It? Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, it's sort of curious. I mean, we we all learn in our history books about the Berlin air lift. Air lift. So, and we never hear about this amazing story, which um, you sort of have to wonder how how and why it got, got lost, but... Um, I think it's a, a wonderful story and one that's particularly nice to hear from an actual participant in, in the parade and uh, that very important historical event. And I hope that um, we uh, spark people's interest here and maybe we will wind up with an eventual Adiance uh, Francaise field trip or something to uh, both museums. Um, and we want to really thank you so much for uh, sharing your story and putting together all the really? information. And Eric, thank you for your Zoom technology <laughs> and helping show the pictures. Um, and I think um, that's probably. Okay, can I read? Yeah. Let me let me read what just popped up in the um, in the chat from Tara Sullivan it says this pre this presentation is such a delight to me and this information is a total surprise. I did a specific study on World War II in high school and college and knew nothing about these trains. I did not know about the Vermont Military Museum either. What a great presentation! Okay. I think that I think that I, I think that sums it up very nicely. I, I think even in France, they don't know about it anymore. <laughs> yeah, I talked yeah. to my relatives and, and one cousin, actually, he was 10 years older than I. He had been at the movies and at the time they were giving um, newsreels, you know, before the actual film. And they passed the, the this parade and he said, oh, that's Bridget. I mean, this Brigitte. <laughs> and he was shocked to see me on the screen. And I, I don't know where that film is. I mean, it would be great fun to have it, but I have no idea. It's well, just so hard to find things. Yes. Well, there has been, it seems like lately, there has been a resurgence of interest um, in World War II and stories such as yours. Um, it seems like every other novel I pick up is, is a story about the resistance uh, in France or whatever. So hopefully, uh, as I said, people will um, get interested and look into this a little further. Yeah, there are many states or some states that have redone their their boxcars totally. And so there are uh, several states around that can be visited. I mean, they're, it's in their museum, so it's not right. totally lost. Uh, right. And I think there's- there are some railroad uh, people that have maintained boxcars in some states. There are veterans, uh, just uh, veterans that have also um,
decided to rescue certain boxcars that were left out in fields and had been abandoned and they brought them back into their state. Um, anybody that wants to know, uh, you can just go online, go to Google and just type in Merci Train and it will bring you to a website with you know, a lot of information about what's available in the different states. Uh, as we said, not every boxcar has been saved, but many have. Many states still do have their boxcars, which is why Richard was saying that there are people that decide to go visit every boxcar in every state, you know, each mm -hmm. one. There have been those sort of pilgrimages uh, that people have gotten interested in going to see them, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, Brigitte, um, yes. the, the, um, the, in the chat, your, your Mel's question has been, has been asked again, and that is, mm -hmm. at what point in your life did you become interested in this to both, to both bring up the family memories and the, and the, and, and what what I now know is an enormous amount of research you've done on it. Well, it's um, probably when I moved to Vermont and was no longer working, and I was going through my old pictures, and um, I came across this picture again, and I think, yeah, I wonder where you know how I could find more information, and that's when I found first Earl Bennett's uh, book, and then when I went to New York and went to the library trying to find more information on it. And I found tons of articles from New York Times, from various states, the, the articles of what, how people um, were so enamored of this when they came to their state. And, and all the stories that people, I mean, they thought this was wonderful. And you know, there were a lot of um, interest at that time. This was, you know, 49 probably mostly. 49, 50, but then after that, it just sort of um, went somewhere. The radar, right. But then yeah. I kept, you know, I kept getting interested and I kept getting uh, people, when they saw my picture, they wanted more information and they were, you know, they wanted to do a 75 year or 70th anniversary film or something, but, you know, nobody had the money to do it, I guess. And it just sort of has, gone by the wayside mm -hmm. yeah All right unfortunately okay. okay okay well well thank you all uh there are no more questions coming in and uh and yeah. thank you thank you uh, Brigitte and Richard for everything and and also thank you Mel for encouraging them to do this okay the post -station You're welcome and May I just put in a plug for AFLCR because through my taking classes with the AFLCR, I met Brigitte. And uh, we had a class together several years ago. And as one when I discovered that there was such a thing as a Merci train, and I went online to start doing research. Much to my surprise, up came Brigitte's name, and I'm like, "Gosh, I know, I know who that is." And she's, she's one of us. She's one of our AFLCR members. So there are a lot of um, benefits <laughs> from uh, joining AFLCR, and this was certainly a very special <laughs> and unexpected one. So. Um, Yay for us, right? In AFLCR. So thank you all for. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to acknowledge Dana's um, mm. comment about that the 75th anniversary is coming up. So <laughs> we could do something with that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. We'll have to have you back at the museum, Brigitte. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm glad to. Hey. All right. Okay. Well, great. Will... Thank you, everybody, for doing this. It was it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks yeah. for everything. Okay. Have a good day. Yep. Bye-bye. Au revoir. Yep. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir.